going to be? My name is Elbrins and welcome back to yet another reaction video. Today we're checking out SCP-2740. It wasn't there. And it is a Euclid class object. I'm now trying to get into the habit of looking at the description briefly just so I can see the classification of these SCPs because apparently they, Dr. Bob and SCP Explained don't really tend to say it anymore uh, in the videos I react to. And based on the first image I'm currently looking at that you guys can't see, this is going to be an interesting one, but I'm already going to make my prediction right now before we get started. It is an anomaly that creates hallucinations for people to see it, and when they eventually are wake up, or if they don't wake up at all, by other people observing them, they just looks like they're going crazy. That is my assumption, and that is my theory for today's SCP reaction. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and get right into this bad boy. In three, two, one. Shebang. The Walking Dead, dripping and rotting, with glowing eyes and sharp teeth. Sounds like a cod zombies lobby of BL1. Stalking through the woods as you walk home alone in the dead of night. Even the horrors of the SCP Foundation, the old man, oh, old SCP man. 106, the gray shrieking nightmare of SCP 096, <clears throat> and the relentless hatred and violence of SCP 682. All these things frighten people, even the staff of the SCP Foundation. But one question still haunts them. One nice terrible, <laughs> awful. Paul, can we just look at this tiny little detail on Dr. Bob? Nice SCP socks, bro. <laughs> still haunts them. One terrible, awful question. What's in the attic? What's in the attic? What is in the attic? There's a certain time of night where it seems as if day will never come, where the shadows have stretched long and heavy across the floor and the air is thick with a sense of shapeless dread. Past midnight, but far before the relief of dawn, it is the time of night when terrors come to life, where fear sits on your chest and refuses to let you breathe easily. Right now, it is that time of night in the Lee family home, and with a knife under her pillow and disaster on her mind, Olivia Lee cannot sleep. She holds her breath, listening to the sounds of the house around her, her siblings were asleep in their respective rooms, snoring away in the kind of peaceful slumber she could barely remember. Her parents whispering together downstairs. She can't make it out exactly, but she has a theory. They're talking about her, most likely. What else could they be discussing? After so many years of seemingly endless fighting, shouting, slamming doors, a porcelain vase or expensive china plate smashed against a wall, she can feel the tension reaching a boiling point. No doubt her parents are plotting, discussing what to do about her. They could kick her out, but she's only 17. No, she has the sneaking suspicion they have something else planned, something more drastic. That's why she snatched one of the kitchen knives yesterday, just in case. She can feel it under her pillow now, its presence radiating through the cool pillowcase against her cheek. Things have never been quite right in this house, in this family. Since she was little, she could feel an aura of wrongness clinging to everyone, to everything. It's only gotten worse over the years, condensing into a fog that chokes her when she tries to act like everything is normal. Like they're a perfect, happy family. Her parents might be content to keep up the charade, but she won't. Not anymore. She's been preparing, packing a duffel bag of clothes, food, a little bit of money, everything she needs to get out of this house, out of this town, once and for all. If they try anything tonight, that will be the sign that she needs to cut and run. Olivia's thoughts are interrupted by the sound of footsteps outside of her room. Two sets of adult footsteps, not her siblings coming to complain of a bad dream. Her parents. She holds her breath, waiting for the footsteps to pass. They stop just in front of her door. The knob begins to turn, and she curses herself for not locking it. This is it. Whatever force in this house has made them resent her all this time, it has driven them to act. As the door creaks open, Olivia snatches the knife out from under her pillow, brandishing it in front of her. Her parents look more angry than surprised, as if they were expecting this from her. They shout at her to put the knife down and listen to what they say. Olivia refuses. It's the only leverage she has in this two-on-one -on -one confrontation, and she isn't about to give it up. She snatches the bag out from under her bed, and she slowly backs her parents up against the wall. This close, she can see the desperation in her mother's eyes and smell the spirits on her father's breath. Her hand trembles, and her eyes fill with tears. 
Suddenly, there's a sound from above, something heavy, shifting and moving across the floor. The sound makes right. Olivia's blood run cold. Up there, that's the attic. There's nothing in the attic, or at least as far as she knows. She's never been up there, could never force herself to climb the ladder up into the darkness without every fiber of her being rejecting it, every primal instinct screaming at her to get away. For as long as she can remember, the attic has been a place she never wanted to go. There's the sound again, louder this time, more insistent. Who's up it there? turns her stomach, a chill running down her spine. <clears throat> Whatever's up there, she needs to get as far away from it, from this house, as possible. She drops the knife, letting it clatter to the floor, and she tears out of the room with her duffel bag. She can hear her parents behind her, calling her name, begging her to listen, threatening her if she doesn't, but she shuts out the noise. The only thing on her mind is getting out of this house. As she runs, she can hear that sound in the attic following her, somehow right above her, no matter what part of the house she's in. She doesn't even bother to put on her shoes, flinging open the front door and sprinting out into the night in her socks. The door slams behind her, and suddenly, Olivia is gone, disappearing into an open world where she can breathe again. Back inside the house, the family she left behind is still taking in the reality of her absence. Above them, in the attic, something shifts. After Olivia leaves, the mood in the house begins to shift as well. Her parents, Franklin and Yvette, had hoped that her absence would make their home seem lighter, but in fact, it's been the opposite. They used to be able to ignore the attic, to glance at it and feel the gnawing sensation that something important, something terrible, was waiting up there. Then keep walking and move on with the rest of their day. But now, without their eldest daughter, the thorn in their side who constantly aggravated and disappointed them, the feeling is getting harder to ignore. Slowly but surely, thoughts of the attic worm their way under the couple's skin until there's little else that they can think about. The house has taken on an eerie silence. It doesn't sound like this in a house where a family of five, formerly six, but now five, live. It sounds like a grave. Franklin cracks first. It's, it sounds like Olivia made the right choice in getting the hell out of there. That's what it sounds like to me. His way to the pressure <clears throat> to climb the ladder and see what's up there in the attic. One morning, he wakes up, drinks his coffee, and summons all of his strength, grits his teeth, and starts to climb. He grabs the first rung and begins to pull himself up. One step, one rung, then another, then another slowly making his way up into the shadowy unknown above. He reaches up with an unsteady hand and pushes the door open. Just as his head crosses the threshold of the opening into the attic, everything goes dark. Franklin suddenly opens his eyes and finds himself sitting back at the kitchen table, his wife across from him, his children playing in the next room while the sound of Saturday morning cartoons <laughs> blares Bob. from the television. He blinks, rubbing at his eyes. Was it his imagination? Did he just have a vivid daydream about climbing up to the attic? He asks Yvette, and she swears that she never saw him get up from the table. He drank his coffee, looked lost in thought for a moment, and then he snapped back to attention. She didn't see him do anything else. She shrugs it off and turns back to the newspaper. Franklin can't shake it off that easily. He goes about the rest of his Saturday as normal, helping tidy up the house, playing in the yard with the kids, and staring off into space. But all the while, He's thinking of the attic. He could swear that he climbed that ladder and would happily swear it in front of a judge. But it didn't make sense. None of it made sense. He decides to try again, or maybe for the first time. His head aches from the effort of trying to sift through his memories and find what he could be missing. Later that night, after he and his wife settle down for bed, Franklin sneaks out of the bedroom. He tiptoes through the hall until he reaches the ladder up to the attic. Looking at it in the dark, he feels a sense of foreboding, as if his subconscious is warning him to turn back. He fights through the feeling, climbing up the steps one by one. He pushes open the door, climbs up through, and then he opens his eyes, lying on his back in bed, his wife fast asleep beside him. What the hell? Did he fall asleep and dream it? But why would he dream the same dream twice, once at the yeah. kitchen table in the bright light of the morning? No, that can't be it. Still, he needs to check one more time, agent? just to be certain. He trudges out into the hall, climbs back up the ladder, and opens the attic door. Once more, he opens his eyes in bed, as if it was all a dream. But he knows better. Somehow the attic won't let him look inside. Whatever's up there, it doesn't want to be seen. 
He tries to put it out of his mind, to close his eyes and drift off to sleep. But he can't stop imagining the climb up to the attic. Can't stop trying to picture what could be hiding above his head. This is his house, damn it. He should know everything going on in here. It just doesn't make sense. Franklin doesn't sleep at all that night. He just lies there, eyes shut, mind replaying the memory of his failed climbs over and over on a loop. The next day, he tries one more time, only to find himself sitting in his easy chair and watching the television. He tries again throughout the day, every time unable to reach the attic. Yvette notices the change in her husband, but doesn't dare ask what caused it. Whatever it is, he's growing increasingly distressed, angry, and terrified. She can guess what it might be about, and can feel that same uneasy feeling whenever she walks past the attic. The question of it gnaws at her, but she's afraid to try and look for herself. She can see what it's doing to Franklin and imagines what it might do to her. As the week goes on, Franklin and Yvette try their best to ignore the attic, but it grows more difficult with each passing day. By Sunday, Franklin comes home from the office with a box of his things, announcing that he has quit his job. He wants the family to move away from the house and have a fresh start somewhere else. He has a I... meeting with a realtor tomorrow to discuss selling the house. Yvette starts to protest, but thinks better of it. Best to let Franklin have his way when he gets his mind set on something. Besides, if they can move out of the house, maybe she won't ever have to find out what the trouble with the attic is all about. The next morning, a realtor comes by to meet with the Lees. He has <clears throat> great news. Someone has already put an offer on the house, and it's way more than what they paid for it. For once, things are really starting to the work SCP out Foundation. The They sit on the couch with the realtor, review the contract, and prepare to sign the paperwork. Franklin picks up a pen and gets ready to sign on the dotted line. But the instant the pen touches the paper, he's at the kitchen table again. Yvette sitting across from him with a cup of coffee in her hand. She stares at him, wide-eyed. She didn't forget this time. They both remember being there, ready to sign away their house and start a new chapter of their lives. When all of a sudden, like the skipping of a scratch of record, a <laughs> the daughter was right to get the hell out of there. Back here. Franklin rushes to the phone, dialing the realtor's number in an attempt to get a handle on things. It rings once, then an error message plays, informing him that the number he is trying to reach has been disconnected. He looks up the realtor, but finds that the real estate agency he was with is no longer in business. Somehow everything has changed, and their lucky break has vanished into thin air. Franklin throws his coffee cup across the room in a burst of rage, and it shatters against the wall in a flurry of hot coffee and ceramic. The kids stop playing in the other room, coming to check out the source of the loud sound. Yvette shoes them away then quietly begins to clean up the mess, and they carry on that way until bedtime. Franklin goes to bed early, exhausted from seething all day about the lost opportunity to sell the house. Yvette stays up, reading a book on the couch while the rest of the family sleeps. Just as she goes to turn the next page, she hears something, a voice coming from upstairs. It isn't Franklin, it isn't one of the kids. It's a voice she hasn't heard in a little while. It sounds like Olivia. Wait, what? Yvette can't Is it mimicking her voice? Her saying, but she knows that it's her. She's certain of it. Just as certain as she is of the fact that the sound is coming from the attic. She's been avoiding it all this time, afraid to become haunted by whatever has been vexing Franklin. But she can't resist it anymore. She may have run her out of the house, but Olivia is her daughter, and her mother's instincts can only be suppressed for so long. Slowly but surely, she walks to the attic and begins to climb up. Hearing the noise, the children leave their rooms to come and see what's happening. Mom, what are you doing? One of them asks, but Yvette does not answer. All she can hear is Olivia in the attic. She still can't quite make out the words, but if she can just get up there, get inside, she knows that everything will become clear. She pushes open the door and climbs up into the inky blackness above. Back below, the children stare at the ladder, listening to the sound of hushed whispers. It goes on for several minutes before Yvette climbs back down into view. What was up there? One of the children asks. She's not the same Yvette anymore. Yvette turns to look at them, her face pale, her eyes hollow. She shakes her head, silent for a long moment. When she speaks, her voice trembles with a mixture of confusion and horror. I don't know. It wasn't Olivia. As days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, and months turn into years, the Lee family tries everything they can think of to make life with the attic bearable. They try to ignore it, but that doesn't work anymore. They attempt to have the house demolished, torn down so they can build something new on top of the rubble. 
But after they sign the papers, they wake up in bed and find that the construction company no longer exists. Franklin tries to investigate the attic again, but it just won't let him inside. If he ever makes it all the way up there, he isn't able to remember it. One day, in a fit of desperation, he takes out an ad in the newspaper asking for help from someone experienced in the unexplainable. He doesn't expect much to come of it, but the ad draws the attention of a secretive organization. Yeah. A group of men come to the door to speak with the Lee family, identifying themselves as members Wait a second, of the was that a reference a to an anime men character? Come to the door to speak with the Lee I think that's a reference. Please let me know in the comments section. Family, identifying themselves <laughs> the character as members looks so of the familiar for a they second. only refer to as the Foundation. The men from the Foundation attempt to climb into the attic, only to find themselves standing at the front door again. They begin scribbling down notes after this occurrence, whispering to each other and saying words like cognito hazard and reality altering. The Lees don't understand much of it, but they can tell that it's nothing good. The men from the Foundation block off the house with caution tape, put up a notice of a highly dangerous gas leak, and then ask the Lees to come with them. Over the next few days, Dr. Dorset of the SCP Foundation conducts interviews with Yvette and Franklin regarding the nature of the attic and their experiences with it. He also speaks with the children that still live with them, as well as several of their neighbors. Following these interviews, the Foundation attempts several more manned explorations of the attic, as well as a few unmanned explorations. However, these attempts prove unsuccessful. In the days following these attempts, the Foundation discovers that all records of them have disappeared, and that the investigation attempts appear to have never actually taken place. The research team is desperate to put the puzzle together, and realizes they're still missing one piece the runaway daughter, Olivia. The Foundation tracks her down, living under a new name and working as a landscaping contractor, and brings her in for questioning. She is surprisingly cooperative, almost unfazed by the bizarre situation. <laughs> Dr. Garrett is selected to conduct the interview, and he meets Olivia, now Rebecca Feldman, in an interrogation room. He begins the interview saying, Miss Feldman, what I want to discuss with you is a phenomenon associated with your parents' home, likely located in the upstairs she cuts him off. The attic, I know. I thought somebody would come after me about that. I just didn't think it would be so soon. Dr. Garrett is surprised at her cavalier attitude toward the attic. He asks if she's aware of the phenomenon occurring in the house. She nods and says, I left my parents when I was a kid, Dr. Garrett. We, we'd always fought. They weren't happy with the choices I had made, the things I believed in, the people I spent time with. There was anger there. So much anger, I thought it might suffocate me. When I left, I felt like I could breathe again. I never went back after that, but sometimes I can still feel it. You know how you feel when you're dreaming and you're trying to run from something, but you can't see it, and you don't know if it's really there, but you run anyway. That's how it feels. He asks her what prompted her to leave her parents. Rebecca looks down at her hands, folded on the table, before she speaks again. There was one night, we had a fight and my dad was drinking and mom was even worse off at that point and I kept a knife under my pillow for a long time in case something happened and they came into my room that night. I don't know what their intentions were but I drew it and backed them into the wall. The whole thing felt like I was being choked and that was the first time I heard it, something moving above me. I dropped the knife and ran and I didn't look back. Dr. Garrett only had one more question for her whether she knows about anything in the attic. She looked up from her hands then, meeting Garrett's eyes. There are always secrets, Doctor. There's only so much hate that can build up in a place before it starts hating you back. I don't know what's in the attic, or if there's anything up there at all. I don't think I want to. With that, she stands up and leaves the room. The Foundation plans to detain her and investigate her story further to try and get to the heart of the truth but the next day, they can't find her. As more days pass and they are unable to track she her down, they come to a disquieting conclusion. According to all available information and legal documentation, Olivia Lee does not exist. Dr. Garrett insists that he spoke with her and continues to review the transcript of their conversation. She remains clear as day in his memories and in the minds of her family, but in reality, or whatever the entity in the attic molded this reality into, she never existed at all. All right, that was a very different outcome to what I was actually expecting.
Honestly, I don't know what I was expecting going in. But it was kind of right at the beginning, it being some sort of illusion. So, props. I actually got this one right. Or at least, semi-right. <laughs> but, I don't know. That was a confusing one, but also a very intriguing one, to say the least. Um, other than that, I don't know what else truly to say, other than the mysteries behind it. The setting to it. The story behind it. It seems like the entity affects anyone that isn't even in proximity to it. Because it managed to affect them all the way out of the containment site. So, I don't know. It's a very confusing one. But I want to see if I can find more research on this one. So, if you guys enjoyed today's reaction video, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you guys in the next reaction video. Bye.